Great. Okay. Well, I think Yanni's working on getting one of our panelists, Ben, to join us. But I think let's get started and just get some of the housekeeping out of the way and dive in. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you particularly to Lamberto, Rohini, and, and soon, hopefully, Ben, uh, for, for joining the session uh, late in the day. Um, just a few super small housekeeping elements. So for version at zero, all of the sessions are being recorded, uh, and they'll be available two weeks after the event. Uh, in this event, uh, the, the way Hopin works, as you probably know by now, just go over to the session tab, and that's where you can actually uh, uh, and enter into the chat and the Q&A specific to the session. And finally, we'll ask that you take a brief survey at the end of the session. But uh, let me welcome everybody to this, this session on uh, can oil, gas, and other carbon intensive industries reach net zero? So we're really getting into the, th the thick of the hard to obey industries here. Um, and we're, we're really thrilled to have Lamberto, Rohini, and Ben with us uh, representing oil and gas, air travel, and steel, three of the industries that are often grouped together along with cement and a few others as difficult to abate. Um, I'm Eli, I'm an associate at Oxford Net Zero. I'm also launching a, a carbon removal advocacy organization in Europe. And my uh, job today is just to try to uh, direct the conversation. So I'm gonna hand it over immediately actually to Lamberto, Rohini, and then hopefully Ben as soon as he pops in, um, just to briefly introduce um, themselves and also their company's net zero target. So we're gonna be talking about net zero as a theme as we have been all day. And we wanna get specifically into how do some of these industries that conventionally have been seen as it, having a much more difficult time than others to, to achieve that goal, how are we actually gonna do that? So with that, I'll hand it over to Lamberto. Yes, and thank you for this opportunity to participate at the conference. Um, my name is Lamberto Eldering. I work as a business developer for Low Carbon Solution. Uh, in Equinor. Um, Equinor, not familiar to everybody, I think, on the uh, on the session, is a uh, is a Norwegian oil and gas company which is currently in a transition towards net zero, um, and therefore also um, is looking at itself to transition in to not being just a, a petroleum producer, but to being a an, an energy company, as we like to call ourselves now. Um, so to come to that, the question that uh, that Eli was uh, was mentioning about net zero, um, I'm very happy that our updated strategy actually is a net zero strategy towards um, a 2050 mark to be a net zero company, and that includes not only our scope one emissions but also our scope two and scope three emissions. Fantastic, thank you, and Rohini. Hi, thank, thanks Eli, um, and thank you to GreenBiz for um, putting on this fantastic conference and inviting us here today. Um, I'm Rohini Sangupta. I am the Senior Manager of Environmental Sustainability at United Airlines. Um, we're an airline, <laughs> hopefully. I think many of you may have heard of, of United, but we're US-based um, and an international airline. United, you know, we've named our climate commitment 100% green. And that's because we are committing to net zero by 25 without the use of carbon offsets. So um, what does that mean? That means we're relying on technology to reduce and remove the carbon directly in our operations. Um, so I not only work on, you know, kind of our decarbonization strategy and footprint evaluation, but also um, I'm on the core team at United that's evaluating technology investments needed to scale the solutions to decarbonize um, because that's really the key to decarbonizing, not just our airline, but our entire industry. Um, so, uh, so yeah, looking forward to, to discussing further. Thank you. Thanks, Rohini. And our third panelist, Ben Cowing, uh, hails from SSAB Americas. He'll hopefully be joining. There's a bit of a technical snag, but we're just going to flow right through and, and he'll join us when he can. Um, very briefly, before we dig into the sort of meat of the discussion and the themes, we thought, I mean, even in, in just now hearing the, the different uh, commitments that United and Equinor has, have made, we've seen and we've seen throughout the day that net zero, there's some heterogeneity in how a net zero commitment is made. There's, there's carbon neutrality, there's net zero, there's fossil free, there's different terms people are using, and there's also different scales of challenges. So we pulled together this very rough, very just indicative chart to kind of give a sense of the orders of magnitude of the emissions we're talking about. And what's great is that the three companies that we've assembled today are really in the same order of magnitude in, in terms of the direct emissions, scope one and two emissions that they're responsible for. Scope three is a different issue, and we'll talk about that later. And then as far as the sectors represented, we've got air travel, we've got oil and gas, we've got steel and iron. And you can see at that bottom, those rough percentages. I mean, th these industries collectively comprise a significant chunk uh, 
of, of global emissions. So it's really exciting to, to be able to uh, talk specifically about them today. Um, so the first theme I wanted to dive into is, is really what I was just saying around defining net zero. So getting crystal clear on the destination. What does a safe, secure, net zero state that we can sustain in perpetuity actually look like? And so there I'd love to get into, you know, what's the difference between gross zero and net zero? And then if you can try to paint a picture, each of you, for, for what it would look like in 2050 when Equinor or United is operating on a run rate of net zero. So if you want me to, to, to reflect to that, um... So personally, I think it is very clear when the Paris Agreement was stated and uh, was looking at or first introduced uh, the concept of a, of, a, of a net zero target for the second part of this century, it was very clear that um, uh, the definition in that would be that to reach that goal, there might be um, uh, still be activities that generate emissions. But on the other side, there would be activities that counteract that uh, by technology or, or nature-based solutions. Um, and that the, the effect of that would be that the one would cancel out the other. And that is also what we, uh, how we uh, look at our net zero target, that by the 2050s, um, we might still represent uh, directly or indirectly, because we also are uh, having scope free in our, our talk at target, which means the CO2 that comes by the use of our products. But then, then on the other side, we would also be responsible um, for um, uh, mitigating uh, or counteracting those emissions that come from that. But having said that, um, this is not a, this is clearly not a business as usual, meaning that by counteracting enough, we can just basically continue with the amount of emissions that we have. So the first priority to get to that net zero is to prevent the emissions as much as possible in the first place. If I can just come back on one quick point, Lamberto, that's really that's really interesting. I think you are Equinor is part of a small subset of oil and gas companies that have made net zero commitments that involve their scope three emissions or really the emissions that are typically attributed to the customer. What does that mean in terms of how you would counteract that extraction? And I, I understand that you have a absolute carbon storage target. Can you share a bit more about what that means and how that contrasts from the kind of historical approach to, to climate targets for oil and gas companies? Yeah, so, so, so let's think it as two questions. Um, so for the first one, for, for what does it mean for us to would account to that, let's say, a KPI, internal KPI uh, or, or net zero? Um, there are basically two things. Um, one thing is that, and, and we currently do, we do a small part of nature-based uh, solutions like uh, um, forestation uh, programs, voluntary basis of that. There's a small volume that we are uh, investing in. But the predominantly amount of that would be that we will be involved in the sequestration of CO2 that is being captured uh, somewhere down the value chain by industries or direct from air or by our um, uh, BEX, so-called bioenergy combined with CCS, and that we would actively participate in, uh, in the sequestration uh, projects. Um, that having uh, an example of that is that we are, we have been active in uh, sequestrating a part of our CO2 that we are responsible for related to our oil and gas production uh, in Norway. But we are also developing uh, or constructing our storage site together with uh, Shell and Total, Total Energies, I need to say, um, called the Northern Lights, which will um, sequester, will, will collect and sequester CO2 that is not related directly to our activities, but is related to industrial activities like cement, uh, chemical industries, uh, and a vast variety of potential customers. And, and those volumes, that, that interaction would be uh, used in the, in the calculation towards, on one side, being uh, seen as responsible of adding carbon to the balance, but on the other side, also counting acting in uh, removing carbon from that balance. If I understand correctly, on an operational basis, Equinor will nullify its scope one and two emissions with removals at some point and reduce them. But you're also talking about a balance between the amount of carbon that's taken out of the ground, if you will, and the amount of carbon that's put back in. 
by someone such that at some point in time, those two flows are in balance. Is that yeah. okay? Roughly. That's roughly the idea. The idea. Yeah. Um, sorry, turning now to Rohini, um, anything you'd like to share on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a, sort of a comparable thing, but we look, we view the, um, you know, we're viewing the problem as just really the carbon intensity in jet fuel, right? So 99% of our emissions comes from one source. That's that's from one, you know, activity. And, and that can be unique among industries, but obviously is very um, part of the course for transportation. And that's really the fuel we can combust. So when I look at where we are today versus 2050. I mean, what I want to be doing is all of us sitting around and we're talking about, I can't believe those were all we thought we had um, back back in 2021. Um, so I, I, I'd like to be there, but I think part of that is really, you know, today our, our primary pathway is sustainable aviation fuel or SAF. And these, fuel, these fuels today have lower life cycle um, greenhouse gas emissions compared to conventional jet fuel, sometimes up to 80%. What 2050 should look like is greater than 80%, greater than 100%. And so you have this overhang of a negative carbon intense fuel that can counteract the fact that you, our operations is um, even in 2050, 50 most likely going to rely on the combustion of some sort of fuel. So it's really the key piece is a transition to a sustainable resource um, like sustainable aviation fuel and you know looking at, at carbon removals carbon capture utilization and storage fantastic that's great so we've kind of hovered on 2050 for a while and now we're going to zoom back to today and we're already getting some questions and i'm also just welcoming ben to the panel who just joined really great to have uh ben cowing from ssab as well um so uh, we're already getting some questions in the chat to, to, in the vein of well what can we do now in, in the in the 10 years to 2030. And so this the second theme I'd like to touch on is focusing on decarbonization first. So it, in, in achieving net zero, of course, we have the removals on the back end, but more importantly, or at least a uh, higher priority at the moment is reducing emissions on an absolute basis now. So all three of you have come today with some interesting and exciting technologies and ideas. We've got a few visuals we can share. I'd love um, actually, Ben, uh, if you could uh, welcome and if you could introduce yourself and then maybe you could answer first and, and tell us about SSAB's uh, fossil free steel. Thank you, Eli, and apologies for having technical difficulties coming on. But uh, SSAB is a global producer of steel. In the United States, we make uh, steel by recycling steel scrap and electric arc furnaces. But in Europe, we use the conventional blast furnace technology. So our blast furnaces in Europe are some of the most advanced in the world. We produce only 1.6 tons of CO2 for every one ton of steel we produce. And, and that's world leading uh, technology. So clearly we realize that's not gonna meet the needs of a carbon free future. We're completely switching our European operations from blast furnaces to a new technology of direct reduction using hydrogen. So uh, green electricity is used in electrolysis to make hydrogen. Hydrogen is used directly for the chemical reduction of iron, turning iron ore into metallic iron, uh, which is then going to be melted in electric arc furnaces. So the first of our steel mills in Europe is converting over to this technology and will be fully operational in 2026. And we'll have all our European operations uh, converted over latest 2045. But of course, we're shooting for a more ambitious timetable. Great. Uh, and I think one thing we, we touched on when we were preparing the session is just the, the distinction between growth zero and, and net zero and the fact that you know, to varying degrees, the oil and gas industry, the air aviation industry, air travel industry, and the steel industry will have residual emissions in 2045, in 2050 that, that have to be neutralized with removals. Um, can you share, and I'm happy to bring up the slide on the hybrid technology, Ben, um, can you share kind of how far does this get us? The, the ideas and the technologies that we know about today, can they get us 50% of the way there, 60, 90? How, how much is gonna be left at the back end to remove in, in your case? Sure. So uh, in the case of a conventional blast furnace steel producer, as I said, it can, it can be we, we currently have 1.6 tons of CO2 to make a ton of steel with conventional blast furnace based steel making. And there's a little bit of additional emissions for further processing. So we get rid of the lion's share of that with hybrid. But there are still some emissions uh, of carbon and, and 
primarily we're moving from fossil fuels to biologically based uh, fuel sources. So those are a net zero uh, carbon if uh, they get into the atmosphere, just completing the carbon cycle. Uh, however, if we pair carbon capture with uh, those biological carbon sources, then we can get to net negatives. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to bring up the, the slides now and I'll, I'll pass it over, I think, to uh, maybe to Rohini to talk about absolute decarbonization strategies at United. Great. Thanks, Eli. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like I said, our focus and our decarbonization strategy is really technology focused. And there are, quite frankly, only so many technology options available to the industry, to the aviation industry. Um, and that's due to basically an energy density problem. We need low weight, high energy solutions to, you know, propel a vessel of 300 people across an ocean. And, and so the most energy efficient um, solution is, is liquid fuel. Um, so like I said earlier, sustainable aviation fuel is a way to rely on liquid fuels um, that don't have to be, you know, base, uh, sourced from a, a fossil resource or, or, you know, so coming from instead of sustainable feedstock or resource. Um, today, we hold about half of the world's committed SAF volumes, um, but that's really just a drop in the bucket for the billions of gallons of jet fuel consumed every year. So we continue to make investments like with Fulcrum Bioenergy, for example, who's gonna be converting municipal solid waste to jet fuel to grow the supply um, from producers looking for you know, incentive to enter the market. Uh, and as you can see here for smaller aircraft, for shorter um, haul operations, you know, it, it's, it's important or it can be helpful to take a portfolio approach in terms of technology. Because while we rely on, you know, that liquid and ideally sustainable fuel, um, we also want to allow different technology approaches that make sense for different offerings within the industry. So we've been investing in novel approaches to flying like new aircraft with alternate modes of propulsion, um, like electric, like battery technology. So we've invested in electric, um, VTOL or vertical takeoff and landing manufacturer Archer, um, as well as a small regional aircraft, uh, regional electric aircraft manufacturer um, that was announced earlier this month, with, uh, which is Hart Aerospace. And, and these investments are to diversify the technology portfolio and really allow space for several different pathways to grow and scale because we're, we're going to need all the options we can get. Um, so like I said, you know, ideally in 2045, when we're looking back and saying, I can't believe that's all we thought we had at the time, um, you know, in order to get there, we need to invest today in technology to scale and become more efficient and really advance through, um, through innovation. Thanks. And uh, I think, you know, hydrogen has come up a couple of times. It came up uh, as part of the fuel mix for the regional short haul flights. Uh, here's uh, the slide from uh, from Ben on the hybrid technology, which will also involve hydrogen. I saw a question in the chat that was to the effect of, are, are we just talking about green hydrogen or is there a role for blue hydrogen? Hopefully not gray hydrogen. And maybe, I don't know who wants to take this. Um, I think also Lamberto can speak to, uh, in the case of blue hydrogen, how we would steal, uh, sorry, store, uh, uh, store the associated CO2. But um, how does that come into play, the different colors of hydrogen? And maybe for the audience's benefit, we can just define what we're talking about when we use those terms. So I might start with that. And certainly at SSAB, we are talking about green hydrogen. We are implementing this technology in an area in northern Sweden that has an abundance of green electricity available to it. So uh, there's hydropower up there uh, as well as other sources. And so we are certainly using uh, green hydrogen here. The fundamental direct reduction technology, however, obviously does not care uh, about the source of the hydrogen. So if a, uh, a blue hydrogen were, were used, certainly it, it would function just as well. Um, in this case, uh, one might wonder whether a person would simply or, or an organization would simply use a hydro or use natural gas directly in a direct reduction operation and then sequester the carbon after that rather than going the blue hydrogen route. But it, this technology is rather flexible, so you could approach it from, from either direction. That's really interesting. And you've highlighted the key distinction between the, the stationary nature of steel production and the obviously diffuse and non-stationary nature of air travel, where uh, perhaps blue hydrogen would play a role in the sense that, you know, you can't unfortunately uh, combust the natural gas and store it then. Um, I don't want to 
force you, Lombardo, to talk about blue hydrogen. We can move on from that. Um, do you want to share any of these, uh, this portfolio of elements in, in terms of how Equinor is decarbonizing on an absolute basis? I know we did get a question in the chat, I believe, about offshore wind uh, coupled with uh, some of your offshore assets. I'll have to check what, that, what was asked specifically. Over to you, Lombardo. Yeah, so, so what this slide actually means is, um, or it tries to show, is that uh, as an energy provider, uh, the energy is used in, in, in very different kind of end users. And I think it completely uh, overlaps with what uh, the other panelists are saying. So when we look at the energy system at the total, we've been very successful with uh, a number of our um, uh, wind projects and solar projects, uh, which you see on to the left, to produce electricity and, and, and flow that into the system. And for a number of applications, what we call, let's say, the less complex uh, application to decarbonize, um, that is a very good solution that so we come very far. But if we want to go to, to net zero for the total system, we have to cover all these different applications and we come farther towards the right. And we see that the time it will take to just do more of what we've done on the left, more renewables into the system and develop those projects to create the mass amounts that we need to cover all these uh, demands for, for energy. We basically don't have the time or the space or the steel to invest in all of that. So we, we, we need to have a two front approach. And that's why we also are tackling the challenge from the other side with other technologies which are more focused on, on, on carbon capture, including predominantly what we have in our portfolio projects around blue hydrogen or blue ammonia to provide a large source of a clean fuel or a vector to a clean fuel like for the sustainable aviation fuel um, uh, to have a, a a clean source but also towards the electricity a clean backup source uh, against the intermittency to to cover all the elements of the energy system because the energy system is not just a kilowatt hour it's also a kilowatt hour at the time or at the hour when the kilowatt hour is needed um, and that might change, uh, might, may fluctuate very substantially. So this is the background of why we are having a, let's say, a technology portfolio approach towards decarbonization. And, and we want to be involved in all the stages of that. Thank you. I'm going to stop the share now. Um, and what I really liked, in a moment, we're going to move on from the sort of absolute reductions and over to the removal side of the equation, which is sort of the other side of the net zero coin. But first, I really liked uh, what, what you mentioned, uh, Lamberto, about you don't have the steel. And it, it strikes me that I think something Rohini brought up in, in a previous conversation is that the three industries represented here are actually quite linked. And so maybe uh, you, you, all three of you or any of you can make brief comments on kind of what's holding back that collaboration where, you know, at some point we have a, a, a commercial aircraft that's made from fossil free steel by SSAB. It's flown by United and it's powered by sustainable fuel that's produced by Equinor, perhaps with associated North Sea storage at Northern Lights. You can really paint that picture, but you know, why isn't that happening or what do we have to do to unlock those emergent properties of collaboration? Eli, I might like to challenge you on the point that it's not happening. Uh, right now, we have an electric arc furnace uh, based production of steel in Iowa. Uh, we're currently at over 80% renewable in the electric grid that feeds that uh, mill and that mill produces plates used for wind tower uh, or wind power towers. So we have a, a very small little loop uh, uh, just there and, and the same mill produces uh, uh, the electrical towers for transmission uh, to grow the grid out to other parts of the country. Uh, we are providing fossil free steel now uh, this year to Volvo and they're starting fossil free uh, uh, vehicles. Um, and we will be scaling those up for small scale production through to uh, 2026 when our full industrial fossil free steel becomes available. So those those collaborations are already started, but they are obviously in their infancy. Yeah, I, I would just add on that, you know, I mean, I think I think what started the conversations is seeing this overlap in someone's scope three emissions being someone else's scope one. You know, we were talking about our different scopes. Um, and and that is where I think, you know, for any jet fuel that Lamberto's making, he's also keenly interested in me being able to reduce 
the uh, carbon intensity of my aircraft emissions. And, 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 you know, we've actually seen enough to really kind of build, you're starting to see so many coalitions, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to keep them straight, but, you know, we, we, we really have seen, um, you know, industry transforming kind of common thinking of what this problem is. Um, you know, example is, is, Earlier this year, we launched what we call the Eco Skies Alliance, and it's a program where, you know, about a dozen of our largest corporate customers who have travel emissions, they, you know, this is even taking the, extending the uh, the circle here, but have travel emissions they want to reduce, you know, it, where in the past, maybe they might have offset them kind of in a silo company by company. Now we're working together to procure more um the purchase of more sustainable aviation fuel and, and spending that money there. So I think it's also recognizing that when our common interests are pulled together, our resources are pulled together and we can really start to, to drive some of these solutions. Yeah, I, I, I would copy that. I see it more and more happening. Um, when I look at our hydrogen projects that we are doing, um, we're not doing them in isolation. It's, it's, uh, a big group of uh, stakeholders and, and partners in this project. We are developing them uh, sort of around the hub base. So we're doing it in an area where you have multiple users, uh, multiple beneficiaries of it. And, and to be honest, um, when the Paris Agreement was, uh, was made and, and, the, and the net zero commitment uh, was introduced, um, there were no longer scapegoats. Before that, we had a world where we had, well, uh, we will go to 80% reduction or maybe 90% reduction. And, and I'm not saying that everybody, but there was always this 10% that everybody was counting themselves in, that they would be the last one to decarbonize. Uh, but I think, I think now it is sinking in that bit in, in a net zero, uh, no industry can hide. And, and you can also not hide against that it's not your problem because if your customers have a problem and they can't solve it, you have a problem. So we need to collaborate to do this, to get to that point um, where not only our companies are net zero, but actually society is net zero. Yeah, I love that. There's nowhere to hide, right? Um, well, we've talked a lot about the sort of absolute decarbonization. We have some questions on the details there that we'll come back to. but. I want to talk about the other side of the coin. So, you know, of course, once you've reduced emissions as, as low as practically practicable, um, there's a residual chunk and that's when you remove or take out of the atmosphere and then store that carbon. Um, can, can any of you share kind of what kinds of carbon removals you plan to use as an industry, as a company, uh, and what you're able to do now to, to anticipate the, the, the technologies and the pathways that will be needed in future decades to get them moving and off the ground? Maybe Rohini, this might be a good time to bring up uh, the, the DAX and um, offsetting, or, or rather carbon removal strategy in lieu of offsetting that United has chosen. Yeah, sure. So um, as you were, you know, uh, pr uh, prompting for me there, um, Eli, you know, our part of our 100% green announcement last year was a commitment to um, our investment in 1.5, which is developing the largest direct air capture facility um, in 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 the U.S. in the world, and that's using carbon engineering technology. So um, we're familiar with kind of the technology here, and and there's there's this awareness, you know. So we support carbon capture and sequestration, obviously, and 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 part of that promise is is you know really this is what we need for kind of an economy wide net zero. Um, achievement, but then beyond that, and and this is where you invest today in the technology that can grow tomorrow, is this um, promise we see in the ability to create a circular fuel, um, to use the captured carbon in an electro fuel or, or power to liquid, however you want to, however you want to label it. So, you know, it today the investment is supporting kind of the broader net zero goal that we all have shared and in common, and and in sort of that future clean energy economy, but there's also a longer term ambition for sustainable fuels. And so that's why it's a key pillar of our climate strategy, but it really drives another one, which is decarbonizing our supply chain or decarbonizing our fuel supply specifically. 
Got it. And Lamberto, do you want to share uh, the role that you see for the oil and gas industry in facilitating removals or, or sort of how that plays into Equinor's larger goals? So, yeah, so, so I, I, I copy what he says, the, the, the direct air capture and the bio CCS are, um, are very important to that. And, and to facilitate that, um, whatever the number is going to be that we need, we know it, it's, it's going to be a substantial number. The first thing is to do the carbon, the carbon uh, abatement. Uh, but then the residuals will probably on a, on a global scale still be quite substantial. Um, you still have then carbon that you need to manage. And uh, it will be a lot of carbon that somewhere needs to be stored. Uh, there are some solutions to put it into products, but the, the, the outlook is that it's got all going to be substantial compared to the challenge. So to have a, a infrastructure of transporting CO2 towards uh, storages that can be used, and, and especially if you look from a European point of view, storages in certain jurisdictions that will be used by uh, multiple jurisdictions, uh, countries, uh, is very important that that industry is able to, to have those residual CO2s managed and stored is very important. So that's why today already, it is very important that we start to develop an infrastructure that can manage these flows. Mm -hmm. And some of these flows will circulate, like Rahini was saying, some of these captured CO2s out of the atmosphere, they can recycle, but a large chunk will also go in. And 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 then 2050 might be net zero, but we still have uh, CO2 in the atmosphere that we would love to, uh, historical emissions that we would love to counteract also. So. Um, it's not very unlikely that the world after 2050 will be net negative. I appreciate that. That's a reminder that net zero is not an end state. It's not a target we're aiming for and then the job is done. It's just, I think you've referred to it in the past as a waypoint on the way to a further target, which is of course absolute zero, where we don't have to manage necessarily flows of carbon. We, we're actually conducting the activities we want without uh, emissions. So we, we've kind of covered three themes. We talked about 2050. We thought about, you know, what what's a consensus around what that sustainable, enduring net zero state looks like. Okay, let's zoom back and talk about the emission reductions that we can all uh, undertake as a company, as companies today. And we've talked about the removals uh, element, which of course is is also very important. So I, I want I want to cover one more theme before we start to delve into some of the audience questions that have been coming in, and that's what I'm calling beyond unilateral and voluntary action. By which I mean, it's fantastic to hear some of the commitments that SSAB, United, and Equinor are making. And on a unilateral basis, on a voluntary basis, there's certainly a lot that we're seeing companies can do. But at the end of the day, our task is not just to decarbonize specific firms, but entire industries. And so there's a couple thorny issues here. One of them is the, the issue of asset disposition. So I think all three of the industries represented here have assets with very long uh, life cycles. And, and the question is, you know, one way that you could achieve net zero by the letter of the law would be to sell off those assets. But of course, then they then, they then belong to another company who's continuing to emit. So what we really care about is the kind of cumulative emissions. So how do you wrestle with that challenge? I think that's uh, particularly in the, in the case of oil and gas, but really all three of these industries. Um, how, do you un how do you help decarbonize the underlying activity and avoid just shuffling around the emitting assets to perhaps less scrupulous players who don't have the same net zero goals that you do? So, okay, um, if, if you point to oil and gas, so, so, I mean, portfolios change anyway. So oil and gas assets have been sold and traded and, 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 um, and, and, and predominantly that's an economic evaluation. And I think carbon cost is going to be more and more a vector into the evaluation. So um, I would not say I would say that certain investments will be done or certain divestments will be done because of the common cost with it associated. Um, that could mean that certain assets will be sold to somebody else who has a lower price for, for carbon. Um, yes. But it also means that certain assets will not be developed because the carbon cost is too high. They, they are not fit into the market. So that's to the, to the point of divesting basically the burden to somebody else um but i think to the to the, to the largest extent it's going to be about 
how are we going to change the market and the sectors and the business models in themselves that the decarbonization of these assets uh, by CCS or other activities um, the same 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 uh, is also for investments in renewables that they can continue on a large scale and are not depending on companies throwing uh, co countries throwing money at it from subsidies but that it is generated by the market so so to take uh, the other panelists products air travel clean air, air travel needs to be the preferred product clean steel needs to be the preferred product and that's why we need to to go and then the investments will come uh, by themselves yeah we have a little different uh flavor of that problem in the steel industry. And it's not so much the problem with the assets. I mean, we have mills in Sweden and Finland. Those countries have agreed to Paris goals and uh, those countries will not meet their national goals unless we change our operations. We're a very significant portion of their emissions for the countries. Uh, so it's not a problem with the assets. We certainly understand that we are committed to decommission those uh, carbon intensive assets and move to uh, uh, assets that do not require carbon emissions. Uh, the problem is uh, really that the production might move to countries and to assets that are under different regulatory environments. So we worry about steel being produced in, in actually less uh, technically developed ways that emit even more carbon than our advanced technologies that we're shutting down, right? So, so the solution there that, that Europe has recently announced is uh, border adjustments. So uh, for producers in Europe, they will not have to compete against uh, dirty steel coming into Europe because there will be a border adjustment for steel imports into Europe. And similarly, they've talked about uh, uh, produ production from Europe that, that is green, uh, having an export credit of some sort. So uh, really, you have to deal with the material as it moves uh, uh, rather than a focus on the asset. That's fantastic. Rohini, anything you wanted to add before we move into audience questions? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that a, a broader kind of um, ag agreement, I mean, I agree with what both um, uh, Lamberto and Ben said, but really that there's a role of policy in there to, um, you know, to make sure it's not just a problem skirted around within an industry or within a silo. Um, you know, we get rid of our assets, that is our business. You know, we're transportation, we get you, we don't make a thing, we get you from place A to place B. And so it, it is really, that's where it's key to ensure that um, there are aircraft standards and that, you know, we recently adopted uh, new CO2 standards for aircraft emissions and, and we continue to, um, you know, create a demand signal that we want more fuel efficient aircraft. And then of course the, the OEMs create that um, those new models and and create that efficiency and I, I think it really goes back to the earlier you know everyone's scope three is of someone's scope one and and that drives kind of a, a collective approach and a connected approach. Fantastic, thank you. Um, well, this has been fascinating. We've got a lot of audience questions which really tie into the different themes that we've been covering. Um, the first one I wanted to bring up uh, from Adrian is you know, carbon emission avoidance, the decision to either reduce emissions or purchase removals is at the end of the day, a cost decision. So internally, how are you comparing these different options? It's usually quite clear how much a unit of carbon removal costs. It might be more opaque what the sort of levelized costs of some behind the meter, if you will, abatement opportunity might be. How do you compare those, those, those options? And is it, what metrics are you using to make that decision internally? Sorry, that's to, to anybody who wants to jump to in anybody. on it. I know it's a tricky question. It is a tricky question, and I, I, I don't, I, I can't show a formula saying, okay, well, if you put in this, then that's going to be the outcome. But um, it is a challenge, and um, the fact that we still have a lot of emission is actually because the cost of emitting, or basically uh, for Europe uh, buying a, a allowance. Um, is, is frankly too low uh, to do certain investment. But these targets that we have and these strategies that the companies uh, that we have produced here uh, shows that there is a direction that we want to go. 
and uh, a number of our product uh, projects that we have the cost of abatement is higher than buying an allowance but if we can still do the project and you can still do that with a uh, acceptable rate of return on your project then chances are that you will go for the project because at the end of the day you want to decarbonize um and and buying a a uh, maybe not an offset but buying a emitting allowance is not going to do anything on the emission itself and um i think all industries serious industries knows that it's not it's not a sustainable solution just to buy the allowances and you know that in the future the allowances the number of allowances are going to reduce so if you don't invest now for being prepared for the future um, it's only going to hold you there for a couple of years and then in a decade you're going to be in trouble because you're not going to be be a pioneer or a first mover or uh, or benefit from that so um, it's a little bit like if you if, if you if you're not on the table you're on the menu <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i to just to add really quickly i, I think it's how, what duration or what emissions are you avoiding or removing or reducing right in in your in your weighing of options if you are um removing a ton emitted from that year of operations uh that has a different kind of return in value than if you are investing for a ton to be removed removed annually through through continuous production and i think that's how we have to look at it it's not just every ton is the same how how many tons are you getting back um i kind of have always looked at it as are you renting or are you buying and and you know ultimately if you have the ability like lamberto said maybe in the immediate the return isn't there but in the long term it might be and so then then maybe you do buy instead of instead of renting and and that's the, that's the evaluation you know you kind of have to continue to weigh because um they're not always apples to apples comparisons otherwise yeah it seems it really is the time scale that that influences that decision right to avoid emissions is as lamberto said an investment right it's it's money we spend now because we're moving towards a future and we know, we may not know exactly what uh, the, the cost of an offset is 10 years from now, but, but we believe we're moving towards a, a future where the whole economy has really reduced its carbon intensity, which means those offsets are going to be very expensive in the future. And, and so as we're making our investments, we have to be ready for that future. And, and that, that's really what it is. It's about a time scale and, and being ready for an uncertain future. And the, the best way to reduce risk is to avoid the, the emissions in the first place. Yeah, that, that's great. I appreciate those points on a very t difficult question. I think what we're imagining is, you know, you could be renting emissions and renting removals. If we imagine an asset that churns out removals on a run rate basis and an investment that reduces emissions on a run rate basis, those have costs. And I think what people want to see and want to know is that companies internally are comparing those costs and making decisions because that's what we hear often in the removals discussion is, oh, well, there's a moral hazard to, to continue emitting if you have the option to buy removals. But it, what, what it sounds like you might be doing is actually comparing those costs and making rational economic decisions that take into account the permanence of the stored carbon, all of these things, such that the, the impetus to buy removals will actually drive you to reduce emissions and vice versa. And the two, the two will go hand in hand. Um, that's me editorializing a little bit. Um, one last question, I think, before we, we wrap up. Um, I think uh, one, of, one of the questions posted was about corporate commitments to buy carbon removal. So that's, in this case, I think primarily United that's, that's made significant commitments. Um, are we relying too heavily on, on voluntary corporate commitments? Is that, in other words, to, to spur the development of this industry? Or, or are, we, are we missing out on sort of bigger policy solutions? How do you think about the balance between voluntary corporate commitments versus sort of more systemic policy change that could procure even more uh, carbon removal if the goal is to get those technologies off the ground. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 not an or, it's an and, right? I mean, you, you know, the the policy isn't always going to on its on its own drive the economics such that you just completely flip over to net zero, but at the same time corporate commitments alone can't just magically 
create the underpinning renewable energy infrastructure, create, you know, remove um, administrative or, you know, certification hurdles and things like that. I mean, we need to kind of come together, right? So United is not in the fuel production business, but we've invested in, um, in companies that are producing sustainable aviation fuel. We also look for um, there to be incentives for those companies, not again, not us, but those companies to, f to be brought to the table, right? How are they going to say, hey, I, I will, I have the know-how and I will produce SAF. And, and so that is never going to happen just based on um, one airline, a few airlines and their investments. It will, it will happen if there is um, an ability to build these facilities and that takes in incentives and we see where it works, right? We see where, um, you know, in the EU where it's driving change in California with the low carbon fuel standard, it's driving the production of sustainable fuels. Um, so we, we know it can work and we will continue to work with policymakers to come up with the solutions that um, get scale quickly. I think that's the key. We could all wait around and then wait for companies to invest and, and kind of toggle along at our current clip, but um, we need the scale quick. And I think that's when you have to say who can help and, and everyone can is the answer. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. I wish we had more time. There's a ton of questions that I really want to get to, but uh, we're going to wrap for now. Um, thank you so much, Ben, Rohini, Lamberto, for joining us from disparate time zones quite late at night for some of you. Uh, and thank you so much. This was a really, really exciting conversation, and uh, I think we all learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And I don't know, Yanni, if you'd like to chime in now because I, the session is officially over, but uh, if people are lingering around, there are a few, uh, perhaps we could address some of, the, some of the remaining questions. I don't know how the recording works if you're gonna truncate it on the dot. She may not be here. Anyway, it's been a pleasure, everybody. Uh, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>